Hey there, Bridgeway. God bless you and God keep you. Make his face shine upon you. I'm glad that you're here, that you joined us for church again today. We got to be together last week, and I'm excited that we get to be together again. If you hated it, you're going to have a rough 35 minutes, but I am glad to be here. And I'm excited because Pastor Lance will be back with us next week speaking to our hearts, and so that's really exciting for us. If we haven't met before, uh, hi, I'm Judah. Um, And I I wanna start today just by being very, very vulnerable. Um, I've been under attack since yesterday. Uh, My assistant texted me and she said, do you like sourdough? I said, oh Lord. I I felt like Jesus when the Pharisees were trying to trick him, asking him about divorce. So I texted her back, I said, why do you ask? She said, because I, I found a sourdough cinnamon roll. I said, what kind of witchcraft is this? What is going on today? Um, So pray for me, pray for me in in that. But no, in all seriousness, I I actually do. I want to start today by just being very vulnerable. Um, I deal with imposter syndrome. Anybody know what that is, imposter syndrome? For those of you that aren't aware of what imposter syndrome is, it is a psychological pattern where a person doubts their skills and their talents and their accomplishments, and they have this internalized fear of not being worthy of where they are and what they're doing. And so a lot of times people experience this in their professional fields, but also in other roles in their lives as wives or husbands or fathers or mothers or whatever, and I deal with imposter uh, syndrome because I deal with anxiety and depression, and when my anxiety is high, my faith tends to be low. And I just feel like as a pastor, you're not supposed to have low faith. And when my faith is low, I feel like an imposter. And so I have spent many an hour in prayer talking to the Lord, like, Lord, who ordained me? Whose idea was this? Like, this was a terrible idea, Lord. You didn't think this through at all. Because when my anxiety is high, my faith is low. And so I have spent my entire ministry career chasing after big faith. That's what I want. I want big faith. I'm talking about audacious, ridiculous, huge, outlandish faith. I want to be the one who can tell the mountain to move and it leaps out of the way. And I want to be able to do that with full belief in my God. And and God has been so good to me. God has walked me through a faith journey and helped build faith in me. And one of the things that God has taught me over the course of my journey, and I want you to write this down, this is your fill in the blank if you're following along on the app or you're just taking notes. Big faith is small faith in process. Big faith is small faith in process. If you were with us last week, you know that we unpacked the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people, and we talked about how Jesus invited his students into that awesome miracle. Today, we're going to pick it up right where we left off in the book of John, and we're going to look at the story of Jesus walking on the water and inviting Peter to walk on the water. Now, both of these stories would be on like Jesus's album of greatest hits, That is to say that these are the familiar stories. We all know them. We've heard them a thousand times. If you've been a believer for a long time, you probably remember hearing these at summer camp and vacation Bible school. And they're really, really familiar. One of the risks that we experience when something becomes really familiar is that it's really easy for that familiar thing to lose value in our minds. And so to combat that, I think it's important from time to time that we go back to those old faithful stories and look at them again and see what it is that they're saying to us in our current situation. I want to remind you that the word of God is living. And what that means is that it doesn't get old, it doesn't get outdated, it doesn't run out of flavor, that it'll always be able to speak to our current situation the same way it spoke to us way back then. So uh, if you will, we're going to look at John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21, and we're going to read that together. We're going to read quite a, quite a little chunk of scripture today, and when you go to preaching school, sometimes they say, oh, don't read too much scripture. You'll lose the people. They'll go to sleep, but I don't know. I don't, I don't buy into that. I just think that the word of God is the most important part of a message. That's the part you can always rely on, so y'all hang in there with me, and we're going to read this together. John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. 
John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. When you have it, say amen. amen. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. And then they were glad to take him into the boat and immediately, somebody say immediately. Immediately. The boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, we're actually going to keep reading. Because one of the things about the Gospels is that they were written by at least four different people. And each Gospel author wrote his Gospel for a specific audience in mind. There was somebody specific he was thinking about. And so they included different details in each Gospel that aren't necessarily in all four Gospels. And so we have to read all four of the Gospels to get the complete picture of Jesus. John's account of this story highlights what Jesus did and how his disciples responded as a whole. But it's Matthew's account that includes Peter's experience, and I want to look at Peter's experience too. So put a bookmark in John, because we're going to go back and forth, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. That's Matthew 14, 22 through 33. When you have it, say amen. amen. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while Jesus dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, somebody say immediately. Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Mm, That's a good word right there. You know, it's, it's the details that interest me the most. I think it's the details that just have some, some meat that I just want to pick at a little bit for the next few minutes. I, I want to start off with the location of the disciples. The, the text tells us the disciples are in the boat. And I want to talk about why they're in the boat. Because Matthew's account tells us that Jesus sends the disciples ahead by themselves, that Jesus makes them get into this boat. It's the Greek word enankasin. It means he compels them to get into this boat. This is important for us because what it tells us is that the disciples are not being disobedient. They're not being self-serving. They're not being sinful. They're not being rebellious. They are being obedient to God by being in this boat. And so everything that they're about to experience, this rough and turbulent storm, is directly tied to their compliance to Jesus. I think that's important for us to acknowledge just because I think sometimes we equate right with easy. That there's some part of us that just believes that if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, if I'm being obedient, if I'm being good, life should be easy. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. I know that you don't think that you should have like a completely problemless life, but we have like two lists of problems, right? This is the list for good people, and this is the list for bad people. And if I'm a good person, well, I shouldn't have any of the issues on this list. And it's because we have this works-based mentality that somehow if I'm being obedient to the Lord, that I have earned a good life. But that is not biblical, The Bible actually says your days will be short and they're going to be full of trouble. Nobody's trying to trick you here, right? And I don't want you to feel terrible if you have leaned into this idea that I deserve to have a life without these kinds of problems. In Jesus' day, they struggled with this too. 
In first century Palestine, they believed that if you had ailment in your body, if you had something like leprosy, it was probably because you had sinned or your parents had sinned before you. And if you had a lot of money and you were really wealthy, it was probably because God was blessing you because you were a good person, but this is not true. And so what do we do when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing? Being obedient. God, I'm where you told me to be. And all hell is breaking loose. John's account tells us that the disciples were about three or four miles away from the land when the sea became rough and the strong wind started to blow. Three or four miles doesn't seem that long, but you ever swam three or four miles? I mean, I mean, swam and sure. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you're a really good swimmer. Maybe, maybe we have a lot of people that watch with us online. Maybe, you know, Olympic gold medalist Michael Phelps is watching online and Brother Phelps would say, I can swim for three, three miles. But you ever swam for three miles in like choppy water, turbulent sea? During the fourth watch, Matthew's account says it was during the fourth watch. That's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And you ever swam at three a.m. in the morning in choppy water when you're already tired. If you were with us last week, we talked about how when they began feeding the 5,000 people, they were exhausted. This takes place right after they finished feeding the 5,000. So you mean to tell me, Lord, that you have sent me into a situation that I'm ill-equipped for, right? There are no life jackets in this boat. There are no floaty tubes. You have sent me into a situation that I'm ill-equipped for where all of the elements are against me and there are all these elements that I can't control. I don't know about you, but I can't control the weather. I've tried. Doesn't work for me, right? On top of that, John and Matthew's accounts say that Jesus was not physically with them, that he had remained to dismiss the crowds and to pray. So Jesus, you sent me into a bad situation where I don't have anything that I need to make it through this situation and you're not even here. And some of you know what that feels like. What it feels like when you're going through something rough and it seems like God is not present in your situation, right? It seems like, I mean, you know intellectually he's there, like we know God never goes away, but you don't feel like he's present in your situation and it just seems like God is absent. And, and when we feel abandoned by God, we actually have the proclivity to be angry with God. And so there are a whole lot of us as believers who are angry with God because we feel abandoned by God. And we're not often taught that it's okay to have emotions for God. And we feel like we're not allowed to be angry with God. So we try to pretend that we're not angry with God. And we just walk around just angry at the world. But who we're really angry at is, is God because we don't feel like he's close to us. Feeling abandoned by God is quite possibly how the first people who read the story felt. Matthew was writing his gospel at a particular time when Christians are being persecuted. Now, I want to be clear about persecution because we're a little soft as the New Testament church today. You know, we're a little, that's all right. We're a little sensitive. You know, if they say they don't like us, they're trying to persecute us. I'm talking about real persecution. I'm talking about when they used to feed Christians to lions in arenas for the entertainment of politicians. I don't know about you, but nobody has ever tried to feed me to a lion because I said I love Jesus. So that's what I'm talking about when I say persecution. By the time Matthew has written his gospel, Peter has already been crucified. And so Matthew, he writes this story to a people experiencing crisis and feeling abandoned. It's interesting because he starts his story by talking about a virgin that's gonna give birth to a child who will be named Emmanuel, God with us. But somehow between chapter one in Matthew and chapter 14 that we're reading today, we've gone from God with us to God, where are you at? And some of y'all experience that every Sunday because you come here and you experience God and you feel this presence of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord move. But by the time you get back to your house, it seems like God has stayed right here at church and left you to navigate your tumultuous life, weathering the storm and waves are beating against your little inadequate and ill-equipped boat. I wanna to talk to some angry people today. Some folks who are feeling abandoned. When we read the story of, of the disciples being in this storm, it's interesting because 
it seems like the storm isn't even what really freaks them out. Neither John nor Matthew's account mention the response of the disciples to the storm. What seems to freak them out is what Jesus is doing in the storm. Andrew and Simon, these are fishermen, right? They know a thing or two about choppy water. Uh, So it's not that the water isn't dangerous, but like we know what to expect from dangerous water. You know, we know how to navigate dangerous water. We know what to do with the boat and how to steer and and how to handle dangerous water. We don't know how to handle when strange men are walking on the water in the middle of the night doing things that we haven't seen them do before or done ourselves. We don't know how to handle it when God does something brand new. It's funny, people don't really struggle with danger when it's familiar. People People aren't really bothered by chaos if it's familiar. But when God starts to do unfamiliar things, we struggle. That's why some of us can only stomach Jesus if we put him in the box of familiar. If we walk into a church and God is doing something else in that church, we're like, ooh, they don't serve God at all. We don't know what's going on in that church. It's not because it's bad. It's just because it's unfamiliar. And when God does a new thing, it can make us afraid. Scholars, when they talk about this story, they often debate whether or not like it really happened whether or not like Jesus literally walked on the water and allowed Peter to literally walk on the water. And there's a lot of different theories about whether or not it's true. Uh, I tend to believe that it's true. The real question that they have about this is, is whether Jesus could really work miracles. That's a question that's important to us today because a lot of us say that Jesus can work miracles, just not radical miracles. We're comfortable with miracles that there's some small caveat of explanation. Like, Jesus, I know you can do healing, and I'm comfortable with that because, well, I can say, like, maybe just the chemo worked, right? Maybe it was just, like, the medicine that you took. But when Jesus starts doing things that are just outside of explanation, it gets really, really uncomfortable for us. We don't, we don't love the idea of radical miracles, and there are several, there are several reasons why, Right? But, but, but here's, here's the fundamental truth. If radical miracles are not possible, then we have to doubt the resurrection. Amen. And if we doubt the resurrection, then we might as well close the doors to the church. What are we doing here, yep. right? Our, our faith is fundamentally built on the possibility of radical miracles. The resurrection was the most radical miracle. And if the resurrection isn't true, we are wasting our time. What that means is that to be a believer is to fundamentally accept that miracles, radical, crazy, outlandish miracles are still possible. Now, here's the challenging part, right? If I accept that radical miracles are possible, if I accept that God can do anything, then I have to wrestle with why he hasn't done the radical miracle that I've been asking for. I've been laying on my face, praying to the Lord, Lord, please, I need you to do this. I need you to do this. And why hasn't he done it? Is it because I haven't been good enough? Is it because he doesn't like me? Is it because he doesn't love me? Is it because he's not able? A lot of us wrestle with radical miracles because we got control issues. Because to accept that God can do radical miracles also means I have to accept that I don't get to control them, that I don't get to decide when and where and how and how big and the scope and the shape of the miracle. It means that I don't get to dictate to God how he is God. And that's really, really hard for us. Sometimes that's, that's really, really painful because it means that we get caught up in storms. If the disciples had been able to choose their miracle, they probably would have said, Lord, the miracle that we want is to not have the storm come at all. And so as they're being tossed in this boat... I'm sure they wrestle with, is God able? Is God able? Often when we tell this story, we tell it so quick that it's like, oh, they get in the boat, the storm comes, they walk, Jesus saves them, right? But we actually don't know how long they were in this boat, right? And, and, and when you're going through something painful and scary, even if it's only five minutes, it seems like forever, doesn't it? I want to stir up revival in the belief that miracles are possible. But I actually, there's something more important to this 
than just the idea that God can do miracles. I need you not just to have hope in the ability of God's hand, but also in the anatomy of God's heart. We can't just believe that God is capable. We have to believe in his character. We have to lean into the reality that God is good. Why? Because if God really is capable and God really is fundamentally good, then that means I'm safe in every situation. That means that, that if God is doing the big miracle that I've been praying for in the way that I want him to do it, in the timing that I've asked him for, then I can shout hallelujah. That also means that if God doesn't do the big miracle in the way and in the timing and in the shape and in the way that I want him to do it, I can still shout hallelujah. It means that his yes is good, but it also means that his no is good. And it means that even when I'm having a hard time seeing him through the waves of my life, if I can't see what he is doing, I can trust his heart and I don't have to throw away the possibility of miracles just because I'm not seeing them in the ways that I wanted them to see. So they're in the storm. Jesus says that they're, sees that they're scared. And he says to them, he says, it is I, do not be afraid. And I just, I love the way he offers comfort to them. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't promise that he's going to remove them from the storm, but he promises that he'll be present with them through it. L listen, God being present with us is a miracle all by itself. God being with us, that, that, that is a big miracle. I think sometimes we take that for granted. Just the, that God will walk with us. No, that is a miracle by itself. The presence of God with his people is the overarching narrative and the overarching theme of all of scripture. That's how we've got to read our Bible. The, the, the whole Bible tells the story of God choosing to be with us. It starts in Genesis with God creating Adam and Eve, humanity. Why does he create us to be with him? right? What happens next? Sin breaks that relationship. And we know that a break in the relationship with God equates to the loss of God's presence. That's Genesis 1 through 3 right there. All the rest of the books, Exodus through Revelation, are all about the plan that God has to reestablish humanity with fellowship with God. And so God allows us to see through the scriptures the consequences of the loss of God's presence. We see it in Cain killing Abel. We see it in the bad behavior of the community around Noah. We see it at the Tower of Babel, which is really a symbol of humanity's rebellion. But we also get to see how committed God is to being with us. What do we see him do? We see him establish a covenant with Abraham that reestablishes the presence of God with his chosen people. And this covenant, this promise, it culminates in this multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural community of God's people who he's with. And so the comfort that he offers is not that, that your problem is going to disappear. The comfort that he offers is that, that he's going to be with you through it. What did God tell Moses? He told him, he said, the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. It's not holy because it's got like good fertilizer in it. It's holy because God is standing on it. I, I want to say this to you today in this room, where you are sitting is holy ground. It's not holy because like we built a warehouse and put bridgeway on the front and called it a church. It's holy because God is with you in it. God told Moses in Exodus, I will be with you. And nothing you encounter is going to change that. Nothing you do is going to change that. Over and over again in the Old Testament, we see Israel make poor choice after poor choice, bad decision after bad decision. They never, they never quite figure it out. But we see God's promise to be with them remains. And so when Jesus sees his students in this boat scared out of their minds, his response to them is, it is I. In the Greek, it is ego, emi. It is me. I am. He's literally saying his name. I am. He is saying, 
I will be with you. And those words, I am, I exist, I am present with you. Those words are at the center of this story and of the whole Bible narrative. What that means for us is that adversity is not necessarily a sign of God's displeasure. Your life may be hard right now. That doesn't mean God is mad at you. And what we also know is that prosperity is not necessarily a sign of God's pleasure. I know all kind of wealthy people that are on a slow fall to hell. (laughs) This also means, paradoxically, that the, the storms of our life have the proclivity to be a blessing to us because God is with us in them. I don't know about you, but when things are going badly, for some reason, my heart is just so much more receptive to Jesus. There's something about being needy that makes me real receptive to Jesus. And so if we accept that God's promise that I will be with you, that is still a good promise, then we can trust that today he's still showing up in the midst of our troubles. And in the new Judah Dwight version, he's saying, cheer up, buttercup. It's me. I'm with you. I'm walking through it with you. Don't be afraid. And so Matthew 14, 28, Peter answers him. He says, Lord, if it's you, let me come out on the water. And Jesus says, come. And so Peter gets out of the boat and he walks across the water and he comes to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He said, Lord, save me. It's interesting to me because his faith starts off so solid. I mean, you got to have solid faith to like step out of a perfectly good boat in a storm. You know what I'm saying? I I just wonder what the other disciples were thinking as he started stepping over the boat. Like, all right, Peter, you got that by yourself, brother. You, whatever, that's what the Lord told you. I'm going to, you know. So he starts with such big faith and he steps out of this boat. And we don't know how long of a walk it was between the boat and Jesus. But somehow along that journey, as he walks, his face starts to dwindle and get smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and that happens over the journey of life, right? When, when God first made you that promise, boy, you, they couldn't tell you anything about it, right? You believed it with your whole heart, but over time, it can start to dwindle. The text says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. What strikes me is the irony that Peter is walking on the water, but scared of the wind. Walk, Peter, you're walking on the water, but you're scared of the wind. And it's that dichotomy of the reality that there are some areas in my life that like my faith is huge. And there are other areas that that I doubt and that I struggle in. And what I want you to understand is that Peter's life gets put in jeopardy, not by the violence of the wind and the waves, but by the smallness of his faith. Small faith alone will kill you. Small faith alone is dangerous. Small faith that is not in process is risky. I'll tell you why. Small faith, when it is not in process, it's too eager to sin and compromise. Small faith, when it's not in process, will break the rules, will bend, will say, you know what? I don't, I'm not going to do it exactly how God told me to do it. Small faith, when it is not in process, it has too high of an opinion of its own power. Small faith, when it's not in process, refuses to just depend on God. Small faith, when it's not in process, says, I'm going to depend 100% on God, but God, just give me like 10% for my political system. Just 10% for money. Just just 10% for position or attachment. Small faith, when it's not in process, won't depend entirely on God. Small faith, when it's not in process, is too easily affected by its surroundings. The second something around it changes, it gets knocked down. That's really why the pandemic was so hard for us, isn't it? Because all of a sudden, the things that we thought we could count on and depend on were pulled out from under us. And a lot of us had small faith that wasn't in process, and so we were in the Walmart fist fighting over toilet paper. (laughs) 
Small faith, when it's not in process, is too quick to exaggerate a situation. It makes bad situations bigger than they are. Hear me when I say I know that sometimes situations are bad, but remember, everything stands under the shadow of our God. And I want you to have big faith. What is big faith? Big faith is small faith in process. How do I know my small faith is in process? Well, you know your small faith is in process when it is striving to do what Jesus says. When Jesus says, come, your small faith should be trying to step over the edge of that boat. Small faith is in process when it struggles to come to Jesus. When that is the central goal. I don't know how the rest of the stuff is going to work out. All I know is if nothing else, I am trying to get to that man, Jesus, and I am going to struggle until I get there. Small faith in process is humble. It acknowledges that it still needs to grow. Small faith is in process when it prays when it's in trouble. The difference between small faith and small faith in process is the difference between the students who stayed in the boat and the one who climbed out of it. His faith wasn't perfect, but it was big because it was in process. It faltered and it struggled and it wrestled, but it was in process, striving and struggling to come to Jesus. His small faith cried out, Lord, save me. I think a lot of us would have drowned if we had been Peter. Not because Jesus isn't willing to save us, but because we wouldn't have been willing to say, I'm sinking. Bible says that he cried out, I need you, Lord. I'm falling apart here. I'm drowning here. And what I love, love about this is that he didn't wait till it was at its most critical point to call out for help. Look at verse 30. It says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink he cried out. A lot of us carry shame when we begin to sink. And so we lean into this performative piety and we get up here and we're preaching and sinking and playing the keys and sinking and worship leading and sinking and volunteering and sinking and coming to church and Bible study and sinking and we will not cry out, I am struggling here. And some of that, that's, a lot of that, that's our fault as a church just because we haven't created a culture where like people can feel safe saying, hey, I'm struggling here. But I'll tell you this, small faith and process ask for help and ask for help early. And what's beautiful is that Jesus responds to small faith and process. Verse 31 in Matthew, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I just want you to notice that Jesus saves Peter first before he starts having a conversation with him about his faith, before he brings challenge and correction and teaching. He saves him first. I think a real barrier to some of us having big faith is that like, we're scared we're going to get in trouble. Lord, daddy is going, we're going to get in trouble. When we get home, daddy is going to yell at us. But that's not how we see Jesus operate. He saves him before he brings challenge, before he brings correction, before he has any conversation, he says, I'm going to get you out of that thing that's got you stuck. And after he rescues him, he addresses Peter's faith. He asks him, why did you doubt? Why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? I'm talking to you now, not Peter. Why do you doubt? <laughs> I mean, really, like, like, have you ever found God to be unfaithful to his promise? Is there, is there somebody that knows more than God, that's wiser than God, that has told you that you can't trust God? Is your problem so extremely difficult that God is not able to help? Has God changed his character? You know he's old, so maybe... Maybe over time he's just, maybe he's changed his character. Maybe, maybe he's not as powerful as he used to be. Why do you doubt? These aren't just rhetorical questions. We, we actually have to get to the bottom of, of what is supporting our doubt. We have to get underneath there and see what is it that's holding up my doubt in God. And then we have to get us a sledgehammer and take it out. 
I, I need you to understand, doubting God is absolutely unreasonable. It's unreasonable. It is illogical. God has too much of a track record. There's, there's too much history. It, just in your own life. This is why we're told to count our blessings and name them one by one is so that we can remind ourselves, you know what, God, is, God has come through for me before. God has held me together. There, is, I, there are things I've been through that should have killed me, but I'm still here. That's God Amen. being in my life. There's a, a theological thinker, his name is Charles Spurgeon, and he said, if we're going to trust Jesus at all, we've got to trust him all together. Our doubts are unreasonable. And small faith, when it's in process cause doubt into account. He says, come here, dad, I want to talk to you about something. Sit down right here. I want to have a conversation with you. And so Peter's small faith and process calls out to the Lord to be saved and Jesus saves him and calls him into big faith. Verse 32 says, and when they got into the boat, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, often when we picture the story, we picture Jesus pulling Peter up and like, they're back at the boat. But we actually don't know how far that journey was. I just say that to say that, that when we get rescued, God rescuing us doesn't, isn't like a full stop shop, like, oh, everything becomes easy because God is rescuing us, right? Jesus pulled Peter up out of the water, but they still had to walk back to the boat, right? Verse 32 says, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. A lot of times in this story, when we get to Peter's part, we forget about the other disciples. But they're still there. They're in the boat. They're watching this. And I'm so glad that Peter didn't try to hide his experience. Even though it was probably a little bit embarrassing. I'm so glad that Peter allowed his friends to see his small faith be developed and be processed. Small faith when it's in process is shared. Small faith in process is transparent. Transparency is a faith building tool that each of us has. You may not have the gift of preaching. You may not have the gift of worship leading. You may not have the gift of helps, but you do have transparency the opportunity to share with others the way God is developing your faith. I wonder, as I read this, if Bartholomew and Thaddeus thought about this moment watching Peter on the water when they were called to modern-day Iraq and Iran to evangelize. I wonder if, if this played in Thomas's mind when God said, I want you to go to India and build my church. I wonder if this came to, to some of the other disciples' minds as they were facing martyrdom, if they remembered. I remember the way God rescued Peter. I remember the way Jesus reached deep down and pulled him up. I remember. And so the call for transparency and authenticity is not about putting your business out there, but just it's, it's about letting your small faith contribute to somebody else's small faith process so that together we can acquire big faith. Verse 33 in Matthew says, and those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. They go from fearing their circumstances to worshiping God. And this is the first time in Matthew's account that we see such an open acknowledgement as Jesus as Lord. Boy, that sounds a whole lot like what we tell people they need to do to accept salvation, doesn't it? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. So really what we just see is Peter allowing his small faith in process to be witnessed makes room for these other people to accept Jesus. Funny how that works. And so maybe, maybe just maybe, from the beginning, Jesus knew what he was doing. Maybe, just maybe from the sending them off in a, in, into a boat that didn't have any tools for surviving a storm, knowing the weather forecast, knowing the size of the boat, knowing that they would be afraid, knowing that Jesus' own actions would scare them, knowing how Peter was wired, that he would be the crazy one to jump out of the boat, 
knowing that the wind was going to throw him off, knowing that he would begin to sink, knowing that Jesus himself was going to rescue him, was going to pull him out, and that that was going to be a catalyst for belief in Peter and in those in the boat and in those in this church, knowing all of this, I don't know, maybe he did it on purpose. (laughs) And maybe even the crazy moments in our lives are not wasted. God never worked a hurt. That's good, Mike. Maybe, maybe in the Father's hands, everything is used. Maybe everything works together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Boy, don't that sound like scripture? That sounds familiar. Doesn't that sound familiar? And maybe we can trust him that he is able and good. And we can have big faith. And big faith can be the bridge between our faulty human insecurities and failures and God's perfect will. Maybe big faith can be the bridge that gets us across a global pandemic, a polarized political system, an economy teetering on the edge of disaster, waves of racism, a dying planet, strained relationships, and then we'll get to the stuff going on at your house. (laughs) Maybe big faith is how we get across the water. I don't know where you are in your process, but I want to pray for you. So I'm going to invite you to stand up and, and, and just join me in prayer. You can all stand up together. And just join me in prayer. I don't know where you are in your process. Maybe, maybe you're in the middle of the storm. You're being tossed all about and you're really scared. I want to pray for you. Maybe you are feeling abandoned by God and you are angry. It seems like everybody else can hear from God and experiences God and God shows up for them. What about me? And you're angry. I want to pray for you. Maybe you're like Peter and you've already stepped out of your boat. Like God has called you into something. You were like, all right, Lord, let's go. But then you started to sink. Lord, this is what we talked about when I jumped out the boat. I want to pray for you. Maybe you're in a space where you're sinking and and you need to just be honest about that. Say, Lord, I am falling apart here. I'm not going to pretend anymore. I am struggling. I want to pray for you too. Maybe you're here today and you have never acknowledged Jesus as Lord. And God is calling you to do that. I want to pray for you. So let's pray together. Father... We are bringing to you our little faith and saying, process it. Help stretch us into big faith. We really do want to believe that you are good and that you are able, but Lord, you know how the enemy messes with us and sometimes it's really, really hard. So Lord, you seeing every heart in this room, every life, every mind, and knowing us so intimately, knowing where we are, Lord, you've got to help us. We are being vulnerable to say, Lord, without you, it will not happen. So Lord, I'm praying for the folks that are in the middle of the storm. Lord, give them rescue. I'm praying for folks who are feeling abandoned and angry. God, draw near to them. I'm praying for the Peters who have stepped out of this boat and now they're sinking. God, rescue them. I'm praying for those of us who feel like the water's about to cover our head. God, you've got to pull us out. And I'm praying for those of us who maybe have not accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Father, give us salvation. I'm praying for folks who need to rededicate, who need to really recommit and who need to be all the way in God call us out and call us in Lord we need you and God because I know that you you really are able and I know that you're good I thank you for it in advance I thank you for the testimonies that are already in the works God I thank you for the ways that you are winning us to you I thank you for the ways that you are proving yourself and so in the meantime while I wait to hear and to see the miracle, God, I'll continue to praise you. 
we will continue to celebrate your name. We will continue to show up for each other, being vulnerable and transparent. Lord, we love you. In your name, amen.